I think so. <clears throat> Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Margot Tinneman from Stanford University, a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist with expertise in OCD, and that was the path into PANS and PANDAS. And she's going to give us very practical information about management of those patients. So Dr. Schlager, Dr. Schlager asked me to give this particular talk, and I emailed him back, and I said, do you really want me to give that talk? <laughs> he said, yes. And then I emailed him back again. I said, well, what about this talk? And he said, no, <laughs> this, is, this is the talk I would like you to give. So I am going to do that. Uh, but I'm really worried that someone in the room will think I'm being medieval. <laughs> I'm going to talk about hands-on, how can clinicians help families, and of course, therefore, children with PANS. And before I started, I wanted to ask, is there anyone here who has not met somebody who has presumed PANS? Okay, so part of what I wanted to be able to convey, but I probably don't have to, is what a serious trouble it is and how, how it is to be in the room with someone with PANS and how, how difficult it is to be in a waiting room with someone with PANS, in a home with someone with PANS, in a school with someone with PANS, in your examining room with PANS. But you, you I think, probably understand that. And you understand how PANS can affect many areas of one's life, family life, interaction with uh, me mental health and physical um, health providers and schools. So in primary care, these kids show up as very physically, uh, psychiatrically ill children. And they truly are difficult to have in the waiting room. Um, I used to work, oh, I still work in my private practice seeing them but recently, I've gone up to 40% time working in a PANS clinic. And when we started, we were in a regular pediatric clinic. And the, the staff was very professional and kind, but they really said this is not working uh, because our kids would be so disruptive in the waiting room. And then you put, when they were put in a room, they were also often very hard to be with. So it's hard for primary care to see psychiatrically very ill kids. But if you take them to the psychiatrist or psychologist's office, it's also hard because you don't have an examining table, likely, and you don't have ability to work up uh, any kind of infectious disease, and you sure haven't done it for a while. But here you are. Parents are very worried with uh, what, what can happen. I think my, my, pay, my child has this or I have no idea what my child has, but help me. And you're, the community may or may not be knowledgeable about PANS and may or may not be receptive to the idea of it. But PANS cause many troubles that can happen at home. As you know, as you've heard about, and OCD, food restriction, separation anxiety to the point that, you know, often the mother cannot go to the bathroom without the door open, can't take a shower, must follow the child everywhere, has to sleep with the child right on them physically, glued. Moodlability, rage, the most darling kids will be logical, nice, sweet, and suddenly someone will walk into the room and they might bite their parent. Just, uh, sleep is very tr much trouble with lots of insomnia. Sensory amplification, meaning smells, sounds, tastes, close feeling, and I'm missing the other sense, but the, each of them can be remarkably amplified and really cause interference. Kids, what we see are fatigued, and when we ask them, often they're in pain, and it's only really that they volunteer that, that they have pain is after the uh, psychiatric symptoms have uh, 
abated to a degree. At least that's what we're seeing. At school, of course, PANS can cause kids to be absent. It may expose them to, to infection. They're very tired. They have to get up. Well, they need to get up and go to the toilet a lot. They may not be able to get to school without their parent in the back of the room or in the hallway. Uh, OCD and hyperactivity may pose problems. Many kids have math difficulties, including trouble with calculations, and maybe easier even to set up story problems than do the calculations. As you've seen, clearly handwriting difficulties and slow processing. So I want to reiterate that first, second, and third Treat the, identify infection, identify infection in family members, treat the infections, and use immune modulatory treatment as appropriate. And I'll tell you just a tiny story. Uh, we had a family who came in, said, Margo, you need to see this patient today. He's having trouble psychiatrically, and it's always about 3 or 4 in the clock in the afternoon. And so, of course, that's the witching hour. But, but what was so interesting was his mother was giving him, she was doing her best, but ibuprofen twice a day. And when she tried giving it, when we suggested three times a day, that got, that didn't, that got rid of it. So he didn't need a psychiatric treatment. He needed uh, immunomodulatory treatment. Just in general, expectations must be so changed when a child has PANS. The patient is very, very ill. They're not bad, although they really can act like it. The patient is often not able to function. I mean, really can't do almost anything that you'd expect them or hope they'd do. So of course, you must lower expectations. And that doesn't just mean for the child. I think that means for the family. And often the primary caretaker, or if you're lucky, primary caretakers, because often it seems like one parent more than another is allowed to be helpful. Uh, and the patient probably requires constant supervision. When things get very, very difficult, while I always recommend calling 911 if things are getting dangerous, um, getting in the ambulance may not get you anywhere. It's helpful. Um, if the person, child, goes to a psychiatric unit, uh, he can be contained or she can be contained. But usually in psychiatric units, um, people rely a lot on psychiatric medications, to which PANS patients respond poorly, uh, if at all. And more of them, and more kinds, and higher doses tend to be tried because it usually helps children who are way out of control and having psychotic symptoms, et cetera. And it's really hard in a psych unit. Typically, the parents can't stay. I mean, they might get an hour a day. Um, that's not very satisfactory. A medical unit is typically not set up to deal with someone who might hit, who might try to run away. Uh, and the, Everyone is trying to do their best, but it's very hard on the nursing staff to be with, contain a child who is very, very uh, activated and can't sleep, is bothered by the beeps of the noises, the lights. And so it's really not a very good place to be either. Luckily, more often parents can stay in a, in a pediatric unit. But to have insurance pay for it, you need to have a medical diagnosis that will be accepted for admission. So that's not easy either. So I hate to say it, but home is probably where the child is going to end up being, which is exhausting and difficult. So you need a big team. The parents are the head of the team. Really, they have to be. They have, of course, the most invested in it. They're with the child probably 24-7. They need to manage the case, try to inf get information gathering. They end up having to try to coordinate care, chase down lab when necessary, help healthcare uh, providers communicate with each other. Probably shouldn't be that way, but it, that's, that's how it is. So when you're dealing with your patients and their parents, 
even though they're at their just end of their rope, they still have to keep trying and doing these things. So I said, be careful about expectations. I just was so excited. One of my fun things to do is go on Google Images <laughs> and find appropriate, or what I think are appropriate uh, illustrations. Is it appropriate to ask what a child to eat? Yes, it's necessary. Absolutely. Must. Doesn't no matter what. Go to sleep right now? Mm -hmm. Sleep alone? Well, you wish. Stop doing compulsions? Stop crying? Stop being violent? Yes. Go to school? Mm. Really? Are they going to get up in the morning? Get all ready? Haven't had any sleep? Sit still, concentrate, do homework, be quiet, and be away from home? It's day by day. So one problem at home can be food restriction. Why? Well, if you're hypersensitive to sensations, it can really smell disgusting. The texture can be disgusting. Uh, you may worry that it's contaminated. You may have trouble actually physically swallowing it. And as uh, Dr. Suido said, you can develop body image concerns. The way to handle it, I would recommend you tell the families, just get calories in, no matter how you can do it. It's like family-based uh, therapy for eating disorders only, uh, well, it's just like that. If you have to give them candy, <laughs> I don't think it's the greatest, but they need calories, they need food. Um, if you need to have the TV on, if you need to uh, sit there next to them, uh, that may not work and they may need hospitalization. We have had some kids come onto the eating disorder unit and be fed involuntarily until they got nourishment enough that they could think better and then start eating better. With some leftover issues of food, either about textures, swallowing, we have used help from occupational therapists. So that's a possible referral you could make. Rage attacks, defensive aggression, these are very difficult to deal with. Uh, they come without warning. A sweetest child would have uncharacteristic aggression. I've heard parents say things that they say, I don't know how my child could have thought of these very frightening things like, I would like to, I can't hardly say it, blah, 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 to, blah, to you, you know, all these horrible things that, where does it come from? It doesn't really come from anywhere except <laughs> very deep in the brain. They will bite, hit, kick. Um, what can help is to try to anticipate, <laughs> well, try to anticipate what might make the child more vulnerable to these. Low-hanging fruit, <laughs> not that low. Hunger, thirst, pain, sensory overload, being frustrated, changing in routines or not warning about transitions, psychotic thinking and irritability, all are setups. So whatever you can do to uh, or have your uh, parents um, address these things, you might have less rage. It's a marked sympathetic output with hardly any cortical thinking input. There's some theories. There are some uh, medications that treat uh, rheumatologic or aller uh, immunologic issues with cytokine affecting therapies, and those people can have a side effect of rage. So perhaps that's at play. Maybe it's the basal ganglia uh, are part of the reaction when the limbic system gets activated. Uh, and maybe just by, oh, I don't like that. Maybe it's so irritable that they look like the cats that have sham rage. It's just sudden. They will say later, I don't know why I did it. I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't know what made me so upset. I love this book, The Explosive Child. I would think about, not that maybe people don't have time to read it, though, but maybe they do. Uh, a lot about it is trying to explain uh, what could be things that could help children become vulnerable. They are not flexible at all then. They can't be frustrated. They're not adapting. 
uh, they really are not problem solving. So the environment has to just be ready to be uh, ready to not push things unless it's dangerous uh, and do the best they can just to maintain. Obviously, well, man, I'm telling you, punishment doesn't make any difference except making it worse. Interestingly, distraction, like if, if you would distract a toddler who's having a fit and then you shake a toy over here, sometimes that can be helpful. Uh, we've even seen it in the clinic. But, I mean, you know, it's worth trying, obviously. Um, you have to set limits on the violence, and you, even though it's so not cortical, I think that, that obviously they still have a cerebral cortex, and having the police come while embarrassing is really important if you're worried about violence, and I think people, kids can process, it, process these things, that there is a limit to what they'll do. And also, if kids know they can be contained, it can decrease their general, general anxiety level. So kids need to know that the system can contain them somehow. Separation anxiety, it's hard if you're the only parent to whom the child will relate. So really, really have your um, families try to get more than one person, aunts, fathers, mothers, uh, nannies, uh, involved in the care so people can get a little rest. Uh, I think I'll, I'll go more into CBT later, but as Susan Sweeto was saying, in the middle of a rage attack, you're not gonna try to do CBT. But when there are available moments, yes, and the, uh, it's absolutely necessary and can be helpful to do it. What do you do about OCD at home? Well, medications, as you've heard, are, in the short term are not really helpful. For residual OCD, they, I think they can be helpful. I mean, there, is, there are tiny there, uh, case studies where they can be helpful. It's going to be at very low doses. Uh, Antipsychotics, kids are prone to side effects, and they are like, not likely to help in general. Benzodiazepines can help. Uh, but although the kids might not be so available to CBT, it's very worthwhile to have the parents understand the principles of OCD and be ready to externalize. Well, that's the pans telling you to do that, isn't it? Isn't that pans talking? Uh, you, maybe you might not step in the way of a compulsion, but you want to set up this discord between what someone's rational mind thinks is reasonable and what the pans or OCD is thinking. You want that, that dissonance is very helpful. And try to contain the spread of the symptoms because, you know, they certainly can spread. And if you can say, Mom, you have to take off your clothes before you come in the house. I mean, that one just no. Because <laughs> if it starts, then it will be reinforced. It will, what will happen, if, well, it's a silly example, but it's happened before. It, if, if the anxiety goes down from the mother taking their clothes off, then it's going to reinforce it. So it will happen again and again. So if you can try to really make a, a wall to uh, not let the symptoms spread, that will be very worthwhile. But with residual uh, OCD, I would treat it like regular OCD. You've heard about sleep being a very big problem. I think the best things I have heard, oh, yeah, I would want to say that this is just so anecdotal. Um, and I hope you understand that about what I'm saying. These are my opinions. This is not, in general, ev evidence-based um, practice because the studies have not been done. So for what it's worth, I've been working with OCD kids and kids with PANS for about 20 years, and increasingly with PANS patients, not that it's growing necessarily, but I think it's been a referral bias. So you can take whatever I say for what it's worth. Um, I'm just telling you what I'm thinking now. And if anyone, and I say anything, and you think, well, I have a better idea, I would just love to know. I, mean, I really mean it. So, thanks. Anyway, proximity, melatonin, Benadryl can be happy. Sometimes a benzodiazepine, helpful. Um, maybe a benzodiazepine, but 
not, well, I think you just do what you, try things and see what would be helpful, reasonable things. Anti-inflammatories can be helpful for pain uh, over time. Well, we see also kids with low muscle tone. Often um, they will be standing and sitting like this, and you ask them to do a Romberg, and they will be like this. Uh, they'll have a, a lot of poor muscle tone. They could be really strong, but they don't maintain uh, um, their postures, and physical therapy can be helpful for that. And dietary changes for pain, well, this is kind of anecdotal, very anecdotal, but in our clinic at times we've heard that when families with a history of, uh, for example, sensitivity to, to gluten, if that child stops eating gluten, sometimes their pain is better. So, Interacting with schools. Most children miss some school. I think maybe all, but most for sure. And most of the children's symptoms call for accommodations. And as good as the school is, as good as the teachers are, and the school psychologists, it must take arranging. It must take a concrete action, really, to help the school help the child. Uh, Hard, it, when you do an educational plan, and you'll hear more tomorrow, you typically write it for a static state. You know, but these kids are changing. So one week, they can't do almost anything. Another week, they'll be them, their own selves. How do you write a treatment plan for that in the schools? So you, of course, you just say that the symptoms are likely to change. But it's not as easy for the way they're um, set up to write for accommodations. They have limited resources. I don't think they're trying to be stingy. They're just, most school districts, maybe all school districts don't have enough money. And teachers have many, many demands on their time. So what's necessary is to tell schools, or have the parents tell, well, you'll read, write a letter to specifically, concretely, what you think would be helpful. If you just say, well, the child has OCD symptoms, so would you please accommodate that? That's not helpful. Well, it's not very helpful at all, but it's maybe a little bit helpful. <laughs> and the parents have to be quite assertive. Um, everybody's busy. So the, a first step would be to call a student study team meeting, which is a gathering of the people involved in the child's uh, education. It's mandated by state and federal law that accommodations be made to, so that the child can benefit from their educational opportunity. So there are a couple kind of plans, and you'll hear it more tomorrow, I'm sure. Teach, teach, have the parents go teach the uh, people at school about pens. And you have the power of the pen. So um, doctor's notes are very helpful, and I have, um, copy in here that you'll get, I guess, a PDF of. Um, and educational advocates may be necessary uh, to get what the parent and the child need. Strep notification, you ask the school to please notify the family if there's been strep in the school. And one way to do that is to send out a strep letter to everybody. Hand washing education, which is like, oh dear, what about OCD? <laughs> but I think it's uh, really important to think in terms of transmission. And prophylactic antibiotics is a question. So if someone's going to be absent a lot, or is absent a lot, if they can do schoolwork but not go to school, you try to get everything sent home so they could do as much as is possible is reasonable. So they could get class notes. They could get the work sent home. They could take proctored tests at home. There's something called home hospital where someone comes to the home four hours a week, at least in California where I live, um, and tutors them and bring them packets that they can work on at their own speed. Maybe the child will have to take a med medical leave. And a lot of parents that we've seen uh, start doing homeschooling eventually. Reduce stamina, both cognitively and physically, is often 
the case. So I think they should take fewer classes. I think they should have a, work, a workload that's lighter. And whatever is done at bedtime, that's all that they need to do that day. I mean, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. Um, maybe they do selected problems. Maybe you arrange for them to be able to excuse themselves from the class so they can lie down. We have one patient that that helped them go to school because they were so worried about being so wiped out that they would avoid school, but if they knew they had an escape hatch, they could go to class and then uh, take a break. PE can be an issue too that we'll need addressing. Both hyperactivity and inattention and frequent urination would be helped by a plan so that the child could get up and get out of class without interrupting class um, when necessary, without uh, asking permission. And sometimes uh, teachers can arrange errand breaks where would you take this down to the office, okay? Separation anxiety, I think, is kind of, at first, it, it's going to be short-lived, don't fight it, and they will go to school pretty soon. That can definitely happen. But if it's chronic, then, I, then CBT is, is necessary. OCD, find out the specific content of the obsessions and compulsions. Everybody learn about what those specific, specific symptoms are. And family therapy does have evidence, CBT, to show that it can be helpful for these kids. And when the kids are in a flare, there won't be much progress made. But when they uh, get back to feeling better, you pick up where you were. And uh, when everybody has the same language about a fear thermometer, about calling Mr. Jeremy or Pans, who it is, and uh, working on the step ladders uh, can be helpful. Handwriting difficulties. Give them big paper if they have to do it on paper. Give them grid paper, just Xerox the uh, forms and blow them up. Or maybe someone sits with them and takes notes. Same with tests. And this is a computer age. Why do they have to write by hand? Same with calculation. I've had kids that they tape a times table and uh, addition and facts on the corner of their desk or they get to use a calculator. Flow processing is kind of like fatigue just decrease expectations. And I think when they get to what seems to be a stable state, neuropsychological testing is indicated. So you can specifically address areas of deficits. Here's a doctor's note, so you'll have it in your thing. If you like ours, of course, use it. Uh, in summary, at some point in the illness, nearly all PANS kids are just pretty much incapacitated, or nearly so. I guess most, I should say, this is not a very good slide there. Most children recover just about to baseline or to baseline. Many have residual troubles, and that's who we need to talk about because the other ones you don't have to be worrying about at that moment. And clinicians can really help the families think about resources, learn strategies at home, and interact with the schools to get help. I don't have any disclosures. The, the clinic for which I work uh, is engaged in research, and we do get this funding. It's a, a, growing cons a growing clinic, and that's very, very thrilling to be in it. And that's 